Nope, it's all yours, Bob. Okay, that sounds good, Tom. Uh, I'm, by the way, I'm, I'm uh, in St. Paul today still. I've been here all week, and I, I do encourage people to come out here and uh, spend some time at the archive. There were several of us here this week. Uh, Andrew Klomka from Chicago, Jim Hansen from uh, Helena, and I were here all week. And uh, we did a combination of research and work to help the archive, and I... I'd really like to set up another week in the spring, sort of after the snow, where we could get some more, a group of people to come in. So you may hear more about that. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the archives, both east and west here today, and we'll just sort of do a review of several topics. And I also will talk about this uh, new piece of software that Don mentioned. And then uh, I'll certainly take questions too. Just to remind everybody, we've got one archive and it happens to have two offices, one at uh, Jackson Street where I've been this last week and then one in Seattle, uh, just south of Seattle, a community near the airport called Burien. And uh, at the uh, Jackson Street end, we uh, lease space from the uh, Minnesota Transportation uh, Museum. And in Seattle, we actually have a membership uh, with the Pacific Northwest Railroad Archive and our offices are uh, held there. Uh, just also for those of you who haven't been to these uh, sites, I want to just show you some pictures of them. Uh, this is the uh, Jackson Street Roundhouse and it's the, got this great ambiance of actually being in a roundhouse. And this, what you're looking at here is actually a roundhouse bay that's been converted uh, into uh, office area. Here it is just uh, last week. Uh, notice they've had to move the desks apart and you know get COVID conscious and that kind of thing. But it's got this uh, great uh, railroad feel while you're working there. In the basement, uh, one interesting thing is you notice the size of the columns and so on, the pipes and so on. You're actually down in the basement of the roundhouse in this room, which is called the triangle room. And in many cases, as you move around uh, between the areas in uh, Jackson Street, you have to keep your head low because a lot of the pipes, uh, they usually hit me about right in the middle of the forehead if I don't keep my head down. So it's one of those unique experiences. Uh, and of course, there's rows and rows of file cabinets. These happen to be AFE cabinets on the back of the picture. You can see the big journals there. Those are valuation and AFE registers and things like that. Here's uh, Doug, uh, person that sort of manages the daily operations there at his workstation, Doug Compton, very helpful also if you have questions about finding things, he really knows his way around the data uh, at the, at the uh, Jackson Street and also just a general good view of all the maps, it can really help you a lot. Uh, I just wanted to point out this really big scanner uh, at Jackson Street, this is a uh, uh, a 40-inch scanner, and you can scan things as long as you want to. So if you've got something 20 feet long and it's up to 40 inches wide, you can scan it. One of the problems doing this, of course, is you have you can create gigantic files that you can't open on your own computer, but there are ways to adjust that. So these big scanners are where we do a lot of the scanning at Jackson Street with uh, a lot of, uh, you can see a couple of uh, charts laying there uh, in the basket below it. And there's also one in uh, Burien that PNRA owns and we have use of. So I just, you'll see that pictured also, but this is a real work, workhorse for us. Oh, here's the group that was there last Tuesday. Uh, Don McLaughlin, Stu Holmquist, Doug Complin, Mike Lustig, uh, Ramirez, uh, Klomka and Kelly. So this was the uh, Motley crew, you might say, that was at Jackson Street uh, last week. Now let's switch to Burien. Uh, you can see the ambiance isn't quite the same. Uh, it's more a more modern building. It's more like an office environment. 
But there, uh, Jim Madsen in the right foreground using the big scanner that they have there at, at, uh, at Burien. And you can see the same concept, uh, lots of workstations and big tables. And you see the boxes there where things are setting out and so on. Uh, again, to accommodate a crew who comes in um, on any given day. Uh, and at Burien, notice on the right-hand side there, uh, there, we use a lot of these uh, Epson scanners. So we're really geared up at Beer and to use uh, high end. These are about a thousand dollar scanners. They can do negatives. They can do slides. They can do prints. Whatever you'd like to do. Very high quality, and they've standardized uh, all of the machines at this. So if you can operate one of them, you can operate any of them. So. In the basement at uh, Burian, it's a little different. Uh, since they were starting with an empty basement and uh, they wanted to get as much in there as possible, they uh, worked on getting grants uh, to install these long movable shelves. So you take the handle on the right hand in the end there and you can actually move a set of shelves that loaded with boxes that's 40 feet long, just you know, kind of like pushing your lawnmower. The good thing about this is you don't need all the aisle spaces. So you can get more shelving in the same square footage uh, and you just have to move the aisles back and forth when you want to access them. And uh, yes, uh, you, you've got to be a little careful because there could be somebody working down one of the aisles and you could uh, try, try to squish them. So uh, we have a rule that you got to look down the aisle before you start and, and call out <laughs> before you start moving these around in the basement there. Uh, but once you uh, put stuff on the shelves, they look about the same. Uh, notice on the floor, those are the, the rails that these things actually work on. So the rail, the floor is actually raised up about two inches. The rails are put in very, very level, and that's what helps us, uh, you know, move them around so easily. On the left-hand side, someone said, please include a picture of a collection right after it arrives. So this is a collection that had just arrived at uh, Burien. And you know, so it's, you can just see all the blueprints thrown in boxes. Some of the blueprints are down here on the floor in the bottom right. There's all kinds of boxes. And then that piece of paper you see right in the middle, that's kind of the key. That's the arrival uh, accession information, donation form and whatever paperwork uh, we have uh, when something comes in. And notice the whole thing is sitting on a movable cart. Now the goal is to get that organized. And like on the picture on the right, and you'll notice on the right that all of these have uh, location indicators on them. And so the concept is let's take the stuff on the left, get it organized, put it in boxes, inventory it, and then give it a location number. So you can then go find it right down to the box. And so you know what you're looking for will be in that box. And like all the archives uh, in both East and West, part of our materials are in that state and part of them are just in a state of confusion still because there's more work to do than we actually have people to do it. So I want to just also mention uh, some of the volunteers that are spending their time on the uh, Great Northern materials. Of course, here in uh, St. Paul, you know, the people, that's what we work on is Great Northern, but out at uh, Burien, there's all kinds of materials from all kinds of railroads out there. You'll see some of them listed later, but these are the people that uh, are doing a lot of the work for the great northern materials uh, east and west so and i thank them very much one of the other things i wanted to mention yeah it's j before d except after z well i put that there to see if you were going to be aboard today and i'm glad to hear from you okay <laughs> thank you that's uh, bill kajic he always uh, gets it i always have a problem with these polish names you know and it's and uh, I never learned that J before D thing in high school. So uh, I try to do, do try to work on it. Uh, I wanted to mention about how we get requests. And there's just a numerous ways we get requests. In the upper left-hand side there, there's the requests that come in through archives. It's actually on our joint site. People can send us an email and say, you know, my grandma grew up in Wenatchee and picked apples somewhere. What, what was the name of the station, you know, and so on. Those questions come in. In fact, I don't know if you know it, Tom, but just recently we had uh, an input from the owners of the Nelson and Fort Shepherd. And they were very interested in a specific spur and a logging operation that occurred one time. And 
they weren't too specific about why they wanted to know, but they were trying to trace uh, the ownership of some land at one of the spurs. Uh, on the left hand side, a GNRHS request would be anything from any of the officers or uh, board members, uh, authors who were working, uh, you know, on projects and so on. And we get quite a few of those to support our publications. We do also support in person research at both locations. Then the groups IO um, uh, organization, there's lots of chatter and talk about Great Northern there. And a lot of people then will raise a Great Northern question, which we also try to assist, or if they ask for assistance there, uh, we'll go ahead and do that. On sort of the four o'clock position there, I wanted to mention other archives. We are being very successful working with other archives. And our plan is to actually do more of this by getting our online materials in a state that other archives can actually see them and interact with them. But right now we are sending materials to uh, the, the state of Missouri archives. We are receiving materials from uh, the various museums in California that come in. And so we're exchanging with them. So we'll send materials about California streetcars and they'll send us materials about the Great Northern. We also have phone calls that come in and then our joint site where uh, people go out and do research in many cases, they'll have a question or they can't quite figure out, you know, a picture or how to find a certain thing that also uh, generates input. So we deal with all of this kind of input with our volunteers, as well as uh, the things that are happening uh, at the uh, archive. I wanted to mention uh, where we are at in our goals for the past couple of years because we've sort of been all sort of all folded together with the COVID situation. But one of our goals here has been just continue cataloging, entering data, and so on. And during uh, COVID, we've actually had a pretty good deal going on here with working at home. We've converted on both ends to be able to have access by computer, or in some cases, literally take work home. And you know we've done a very large blueprint inventory. We've uh, posted 4,700 blueprints on the joint site. We've done numerous photo scans, and we've got crews working at home. We probably had in the part of oh maybe in the last uh, year year and a half, the, just for the GN people working, we've had you know five or eight people actually working at home on GN projects. And if you count the others working at uh, PNRA, we probably had about 22 or 23 people working at home, uh, sending work in various ways. They might send in a, a, a thumb drive, they might drive it in, they might actually log on and transfer it in also. So that's been very helpful. So we've gotten some work accomplished uh, even during COVID. And cleaning up the database, uh, Don pretty much talked about that. That's the uh, uh, database uh, uh, started at Jackson Street, and this is the, called the Access Database. It's Microsoft Access. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of remote work was done. I can log on from uh, Seattle or log on at PNRA or at my home or from anywhere, really, and help, uh, you know, do cleanup or look things up or try to figure out why this has number 365 when it's supposed to be number 366. And that's worked really well. There's been a lot of cleanup in, like Don was saying, uh, how many ways can you spell Washington? How many ways can you spell the S, T, M, P, and P, you know, and that kind of stuff? And if you're going to put them in a big database and sort them, you got to get them all spelled the same. And by the way, we found uh, there was 12 different ways to spell Washington. It's like I have had an R. <laughs> capital W, A, capital W, N, capital W, small A. I mean, you just add them up and they all need to be the same so you can sort them well. Uh, uh, prototype uh, AutoM, uh, A-T-O-M uh, is access to memory. It's the name of this uh, software that the PNRA is using. And uh, I'm gonna tell you quite a bit more about that and do some demonstration with it here in a minute. Uh, we had a grant from BNSF to help uh, PNRA with this project. We've integrated data from Jackson Street. We had data sent out to Seattle and we've integrated it. We've uh, done improved communications <clears throat> between the parties involved and actually actually conducted a demonstration at uh, Jackson Street uh, of AutoM. I also want to point out that about mid-year, we uh, PNRA had to slow work on AutoM because uh, their executive director retired 
and they were refinancing the building and they got busy. So uh, it's starting to pick back up now. We've just recently put the newbie collection in and a large uh, NP collection went in and uh, as a, into a test base. And so it's starting to pick back up. Also want to mention that the PNRA actually provides the home for the, uh, uh, I guess the cloud home you might say, for the joint site and for the NP site and the PNRA site. And they did install new servers uh, this year. The servers for those sites are all uh, in a server farm in Seattle area. And then from volunteers, I mentioned before, the work at home was very successfully done. I really thank Jeff Otto for doing all the work he did in, in getting access uh, uh, to the cloud system of, at Jackson Street and so on. And the other thing I always mention about volunteers is we got a lot more work to do than we have volunteers. So it's one of those things that, uh, you know, we always need new volunteers. Uh, but what's all this cost? I wanted to just mention uh, the cost in 2020 was uh, $13,000, almost $14,000. And I'll go through the cost elements here in a minute so you can see what they are. And a very small income. The income comes from people buying uh, prints or blueprints or photographs or so on. In 21, we're uh, to date, you know, June 30th, we've <coughs> spent about 10,000 of the uh, budget. The budget this year is about 20,000. And again, we've had a small income uh, from uh, various projects where people were purchasing maybe printing rights or purchasing just things to hang on the wall. So here's the budget request. I don't know when the board will take up the budget request, but this is the budget request we turned in. And I want to show it to you because it shows uh, what the budget elements are or the cost elements are for us. The annual membership, uh, yeah. Uh, the board has approved this budget uh, yesterday. And at some point, uh, would you kind of explain how PNRA works and how those capital costs were funded? We had a question about that the other day and I couldn't answer it adequately. Okay, so why don't I just go down through these and then uh, if I don't bring it up, uh, ask me. Uh, at PNRA, we are members of PNRA. So uh, the Great Northern Society assisted PNRA with uh, a large contribution when they were buying their building and getting started. They've also given them some grants, but we also pay a monthly membership fee at PNRA. And what that does is then provides us access to all of their computers, uh, the storage area in the basement, use of the building, you can schedule meetings and so on there. And so it's a, our membership fee to be able to come and do our work. At MTM, we have a different arrangement. We actually lease space at MTM. And uh, you can see the cost for that. And so that covers all the space and then uh, computing and so on. We actually support our own self in computing. At PNRA, they do all the computing support. Um, and, at, and when you walk in, there'll be a computer there and it's operational for you. Uh, our computers at um, Jackson Street, we take care of them. But also notice we have a credit there. Uh, we sublease uh, to the NP Society their space at uh, Jackson Street. So the NP has computing equipment there, and the NP has uh, storage and so on is there. That's, so that's the lease that they pay to us. Uh, we have standard you know, office supplies, which are things like pencils and pens and so on, but we also buy special preservation materials you know, lots and lots of negative sleeves, lots of boxes where we've got fragile documents we want to put in there. But you, so you buy a box that's a non acid box, not just like a cardboard box you get. Those are a little pricey. And uh, at PNRA, they buy the boxes for us as a part of our membership at Jackson Street. We have to buy them for ourselves. And then the computers and office equipment there, uh, that's some capital that Mac was talking about. Uh, one of the goals you'll see for this next year is to add more members working at home. And to do that, in some cases, you know, you need to, if you want them to scan slides, for example, you're going to need to go get, or if you don't have one, a slide scanner and integrate it into their computer at home, or even possibly take a laptop to their home. And we've got more experience with this on the, on the uh, West End, where we've done this very successfully through PNRA. 
But one of our goals is the is to uh, expand that because it's proven to be very efficient. When I say very efficient, it's kind of humorous because uh, you, know, you get a bunch of volunteers together, they like to talk. But when they're at home working, there's nobody to talk to, so they tend to get more done. <laughs> and uh, it's that, but you know, the part here I really enjoy uh, working is seeing the people and I enjoy talking. And then if you find some real interesting thing, you can just stop and look through it, so on. So, but that's what uh, that $4,000 is there. We hope to add. Uh, you know, continue to add people at home. And then, of course, if we do have a computer crash or something at Jackson Street, uh, so that would be used there for an, an office computer. The remote cloud service is where we host uh, the access database. It's hosted in the cloud. And that's what allows us then to access it remotely from anywhere in the United States or anywhere in the world, really. So that's the yearly cost for that. And then uh, the computing technology assistance has to do with, well, what do we do if we really get in trouble and we don't have enough volunteers available who can assist us? In the past, we've had uh, quite high tech people assisting us and our main person has retired. So we put that in in case we do have to go by professional help to solve a problem of some type. And we use that uh, number based on uh, some bids we had in the past. Uh, we didn't actually sign the contract, but we had some bids about what it might take to do this or do that. So it's somewhat of a contingency. So Mac, did I happen to address the, any of the questions you had? No, I think uh, people don't understand the capital investment that PNRA is uh, and how it was financed. Okay. Uh, the uh, the annual membership is certainly not a commercial rate for the space yeah. Using. Oh, yeah yeah okay uh the pacific northwest railroad archive was formed in about maybe 2008 and uh we've got at least one founding member on here with us so bill Sorensen, who could fill in i joined maybe about 2010 uh, became active with them they purchased a building um I think the cost of the building was something like uh, $400,000 for the portion that they have. They uh, got their down payment from uh, us, from the NP, from the Boeing Railroad Club and others to get to the point where they had a down payment on the building. And uh, it had been a building that was sort of hard to sell. It was an old plumbing building, plumbing contractor. The owner was willing to, you know, uh, give us a low rate, uh, give us a, not so much a low rate, but low payments with balloons. So they were able to get in the building and they had um, some excellent finance people on their board who were able to figure out, hey, this could work, you know, we could have enough income to do this. So they've got quite an investment in the building. It's been paid down now to about, I think, 235, 235,000 is what they owe on their building. They then refurbished it. The Boeing Club moved in to about a thousand square feet and they installed a beautiful large layout and they continue to work on that and they pay a, a membership fee also. And then in the work area, you saw the work area there with the computers and all that. Uh, that's all a part of what they do and provide to us for our uh, membership fee and the investments we've done in the past. Back did that cover or do you have any specific questions or? Well, what would you say the capital investment is so far? Is it 400000 to get the building? Then you had to rehab it. That was what, another couple? Yeah, and lots and of then, labor. And then you got lots those fancy sliding shelves. So, I mean, how much has been invested in that? Is, is I would say, I'm going to say somewhere in the neighborhood of... Uh, $800,000. Okay, and I'm not surprised. I just don't think people understand what a physical asset that is. Yeah, uh, you know, some of those first shelving units we've got out there, uh, we had a $50,000 grant from a, uh, a railroad union that assisted us. Uh, the Burlington Northern Santa Fe has been very generous to us through their foundation. Uh, and I, I say us now, I, I also happen to be the president of PNRA, so I have, so I see dealings with us all the time. Um, the other, my other role out there is uh, representing the GNRHS on the board. 
And uh, so, you know, we've, we've had excellent, uh, the PNRA has had excellent uh, support by the community. There's a, a large tax out there, not a large tax, but a very productive tax on rooms in the counties there in the state. And a small portion of the room tax um, in hotels and so on goes to uh, heritage and culture. So they've been, they've received uh, excellent support uh, through grants through those people. So yeah, very large investment and uh, it's uh, actually working quite well. And, uh, you know, I think uh, that looking forward, I'm thinking, you know, we're looking at a successful ongoing operation here based on uh, income and paying down the, uh, paying down the uh, mortgage and uh, just looks to be very successful. Okay, let's go on here and look at some 2022 goals. Um, again, we're going to continue scanning, cataloging, cleaning data. That's That'll be done forever, probably, as people work here. Uh, make more information available online. Our online presence to the public has been very successful. So, uh, and it's going to need to grow, and it is going to grow. And the next one, next point there is to auto M, and I'll discuss that in a minute. That's uh, just a replacement for how we're doing the public interface right now. And then recruit and train more volunteers and not only at the archive, but at home. And this is some sort of a shift for us to be able to do this, but uh, it's worked so well that it just uh, it's, is in our future even after COVID. Now, let's talk a little bit about how we get this information out to the public right now. And then I'll talk about a little bit about how we do it now and a little bit about this thing called uh, A2M or auto M, sometimes people say. Currently, we have an access database and we put it in a program called SharePoint, which is hosted on our joint site with the MP. And that's how the public interacts with uh, us on the internet. And many of you have been out to, the, out to the joint site and this is like the welcome page. On the left-hand side, you can see all the various categories. One of the things that uh, this information isn't is it is not in a standard archival interlibrary format. The information is all there, but it's not in that format. So other archives don't actually in, jump in here and search uh, through this unless they physically log in. And, this, and so one of the things holding us back from wider access by the public is that, and we'll, then ATM will take care of that. But, you know, I mean, you've been out here, you can, let's just say we're gonna go down here to depots in the bottom left-hand corner. And these are screen grabs. I'm not doing this uh, live just because I didn't know about the hotel connection here. But uh, if you go to depots, you get a big list of depots. And, uh, uh, like I said, they're not in the standard uh, archival format, and you can't really search across all the collections. You have to search them, the collections one at a time. So notice over on the side here, there's the keys collection, and here is the newbie collection. You can't actually easily, you can, but you can't actually easily as the public search uh, a certain caboose number and, and look at both of those collections or all of these collections. And that's one thing that we really need to be able to do because so many people are familiar with uh, Google search and be able to search the whole world <clears throat> for something. And so that's something that we're gonna correct. But what you can do, and so many of you have done it, is you can sort by state, you can sort by location, and pretty soon you're right down to the very specific depots you're interested in. You can do the same thing with locomotives and drawings and so on and so forth. But notice there at the bottom, one of the problems we've got is that SharePoint is going to become unsupported by Microsoft, and which means is we've got a few years to keep this running, but we need to look for an alternative, as well as we would like to actually be able to search across collections, interface with other archives, and you know just make it easier and easier for the public to find what they want. And when I say the public, I mean you and me too. So we sort of know how to search, but a lot of the public does not. So that takes us <clears throat> to this thing called AutoM or A2M. PNRA has started a project uh, at, to be able to do these kinds of things. And uh, they, this, uh, they've been working on it now on and off with grants, uh, grants from us, grants from other societies, uh, grants from various associations. So of course it's a volunteer kind of thing. So it goes and starts and stops and spurts. 
And I'm just going to walk you through some of the GM portion here. This is a test. This was the test uh, database we have up. But notice there's more than just the Great Northern involved. So at Jackson Street, we're just focused on the Great Northern. PNRA is focused on all of its member railroads plus other greater Northwest railroads. Well, let's just say if I click on uh, Great Northern here, then I come to some various subcategories of Great Northern. There's objects and AFEs and souvenirs and plans and seniority lists and so on. Um, some of the early reviews of these kinds of things, they were kind of critical. And <clears throat> one of the reasons is we're trying to put these, some of these words and categories in standard archival language. So you'll see some things here that might not make sense to you. These are all variables and we can adjust what is uh, what these texts are and so on. It's just that we're trying to become in sync more with uh, archives. So let's just say in Great Northern, let's just say now I'm going to click photos. There's some background noise, Tom, if you could uh, mute that. So we thought we think that you look down and you're really sad. <coughs> oh, well, thank you for that. Shall I just keep going, Tom, or? But it's, you know, it is what it is. I'm working on it. Keep going, Bill. Or Bob. Okay, I'll keep going. Okay, so now notice uh, on the green line there, I went from the railroads to Great Northern to photographs. And we happen to have four subsections of photographs. We can have as many as we want, and these are controllable, but this is our, our test base. So now if I click on equipment photos, I come down to various kinds of equipment and I'm clicking along here, narrowing things down and saying in the back of my mind, I'm interested in uh, diesel locomotives. I'm okay, I found diesel locomotives, but I can also click freight cars or passenger cars or whatever uh, to come down. Just all I'm doing is clicking to get there. If I click diesels, well, now I have a list of all the diesels. Well, in the test database, you can see that there's only 50 of them, which is okay. But if you had 5,000 of them, you wouldn't want to actually have to spool through 5,000 uh, to find exactly what you were looking for. But a lot of the public will. They're just looking for pictures of railroad stuff. So they'll you know, be able to do that. But we I'll show you next a more of a Google type search that's included here. Notice on the left-hand side, uh, we know that we are down to uh, 50 diesel locomotives. It could just also be 5,000. If you want just diesel locomotives in Oregon or just diesel locomotives in Portland or just diesel locomotives in Montana, you could click on that and it would just take you uh, down from the total number of locomotives to just those locomotives. So that's kind of a click down approach is one thing that uh, ATOM does. Now let's go back to the very top <clears throat> and that's that same Great Northern symbol there at the top of the PNRA that I clicked on. And we'll go down a different way, more like a Google search. But also notice all the other railroads that PNRA is dealing with. The member organizations out there are the Milwaukee, that's the Cascade Rail Foundation, Great Northern, Northern Pacific, uh, and the SPNS. And then our other uh, member, out, member uh, out there is the Boeing Railroad Club. So here I'm going to try this a little simpler for you. Uh, let's just click on uh, Great Northern. And now notice uh, there's a bar up here on advanced search. So rather than clicking down through all the various categories, I'm just going to go to advanced search. And if I'm interested in SDP 40 number 323, I just type it in. And there's also other variables I can use and type those in. But if I type that in, I now have narrowed down to seven SDP 40s, number 323. And again, in this uh, test database, we only have 50 uh, in here, 50 diesels. But this is much more like you would be used to uh, in doing a search uh, in Google or one of the other search engines. And let's just say at the bottom now, let's say, gee, that's the one I want. So I'll click on that. And now I've got a picture I can look at. I can also download it. And you notice the information in the below it is looks different than uh, what we saw at our joint site, but also a lot of the same information. But now it's in standard archival elements that would allow us to interface uh, electronically with other archives or have other archives include their searches in uh, into our database. And also we can certainly search across collections here. 
<clears throat> and it's more of a modern type way of doing it and what we're used to. So on the left, we had the way we're doing it now, we're using our access database, and we're going to SharePoint and the public interacts with SharePoint. On the right in the future, we'll use our, still use our access database or other databases or other uh, programs also. And we'll feed that to Adam and the public will then interface with Adam or A-T-O-M, access to memory. Uh, and uh, that'll just be the future interface. Now, the one thing about ATOM is it's um, an open source program. So Microsoft can't decide that they're not going to support it anymore because they're not the only owner. Any questions about where we're at and where we're going and, and how ATOM fits into this? Hey, Bob. Yeah, hi. I mean, this is a little bit of a loaded question because you and I have been talking about this, but I mean, I, I do get a lot of questions. What's your view for how uh, data entry will occur? Are you saying that PNRA is going to start using the access database or is it the hope to do it all online one day or, or what is your thought? Well, I'm trying to depict the way uh, right now that uh, GNRHS does it, but in the future, there'll be, uh, you'll be able to access, you'll be able to feed to Adam through the access database. And we have a very large investment in that and we'll need to probably continue to use it. But we also could feed to Adam in other ways if we decide to um, just have an Excel spreadsheet or, and again, with PNRA, they have to think about their other railroad history organizations too. And some of them may use um, oh, different names of uh, database programs that are designed for museums and so on. It will also interface with them. So. The other piece of it is that, it, and as I understand what the long-term goal, and we're not there yet, is you will also be able to input direct into ATOM. Now, I haven't seen that demonstrated yet. Uh, I've only seen downloading from existing databases, but the, you would be able to go in and you know type in the data just like you would in, in a database. And, and again, I'm not, uh, Bill, I'm probably not uh, technology oriented enough to know the answer beyond that. So I, I like the last thing you said, and I just want to make it make it known because there's 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 people on the call that are that are interested. I, I respectfully think it's a little bit of an open question. Um, you know, everything you said about access is correct today, but I feel like the the goal should be you know pretty explicit, long run, to enable people to enter stuff online anytime, anywhere. Uh, which means you know some work needs to be done on the data entry side of Adam. But mm -hmm. to that end, and maybe you'll talk about this later, there's there's kind of a process that's been kicked up to uh, gather requirements around that, that people are welcome to participate in. Yeah, and uh, I'm also presenting uh, next Wednesday in Missoula, Montana, a similar presentation to the NP Society. And uh, uh, so hopefully I'll get a lot of good input there too. Great. Yeah. Okay, Bye. I'll go on. Uh, I want to just talk a little bit about some of the material that is arriving and some of the quality of the pictures we're receiving. This, some of the sharing we're doing with the other archives is really proven to be very valuable. So I just want to show you a few pictures and then I, I want to mention a couple of things that we spend quite a bit of time doing also. So this uh, came from Texas. Somebody in Texas uh, did a big slide collection for great northern materials. It came to Stuhl Holmquist from an archive down there just in the last month. Here's another one, you know, high quality Kodachrome slides. Uh, it just amazes you the quality of the materials that actually comes in the door sometimes. And the quality of the Kodachrome, uh, sure, some of them come in damaged, but some of them are very, very good. Uh, you know, these are just snapshots that a person down in Texas was doing uh, when they traveled. And, uh, and they got preserved. I want to know the next one. I wanted to show you something. This is something we spend a lot of time doing. This is a close up, and you'll notice all the dirt and dust on this slide. That's actually part of the slide. You can't clean that off. It's been somehow glued on or it was sat on a table or whatever. But notice right below the railroad or right below the, the, the wires there above the building, notice how we've cleaned it. So this was getting ready to be published. And so we had to take these, uh, use our Photoshop skills to eliminate all these little dust particles 
to get to something more like this that was actually publishable. And we've spent quite a bit of time doing that uh, both east and west here in the last few months. Not just this slide, but we do them very frequently. Another thing we uh, do quite a bit of is we had this picture on the right. We weren't sure where it was. We had some ideas, but what we did was we took our ideas and um, then on the left, you can see a blueprint that matches exactly, or it matches not exactly, but it matches the scene, just that the eras are different, the times are different. So we were able to figure out that the picture on the right is Jennings, Montana. And we did that by comparing, well, there's the depot, there's the depot, there's the tank, there's the tank. There's a hotel over here on the right in one sense. There's, on the left, there's some extra passing tracks. Well, they're not over here and the engine house is missing from the back. So we were able to narrow down uh, the date and the location. And this is something we do a lot using uh, blueprint collections that frequently come from Jackson Street and uh, photographs that come from wherever they come from. Here's the reverse of that. In this case, we had this old picture of the very first depot at Sand Point. And uh, we knew where that was because it said right there, Sand Point. But we had a bunch of blueprints from up in that area that we weren't sure about. So we were able to notice the two tracks in front, Notice the, notice the depot. No, there's actually a tavern to the back and behind the depot. That's on the blueprint also. Notice the house track. Notice the tank and the coal. So this is, again, how we were able to match the blueprint to the picture. Uh, otherwise, we would have had no idea where the print was. And we were actually were able to do some you know, date ranges also. We've had a number of high quality uh, interior photographs come in in the last year. And these are somewhat uncommon because uh, not everybody was walking around with their iPhone, of course, but we've had a, quite a few very nice interiors that have arrived. These just recently came from Stu Holmquist, again, from an archive that had all this uh, Empire Builder stuff and didn't know what to do with it, contacted Stu and said, would you like to have it? And we ha he picked up about, I think it was 250 photographs of this kind. Of course, they're all public relations and made and so on. So they're very well composed. But here we are in you know, sort of a transitional period between uh, diesel and steam, but the high quality uh, uh, is just amazing. And you notice that uh, marker, that uh, switch light down there, very similar to the one that Mac has in his auction, by the way. Um, again, very high quality images have been coming in from uh, our archive sharing. And then this was my favorite that's come in lately. Uh, in fact, I liked it so much, I made archive business cards with it. So that's why I picked it for the front here. Let me just summarize and then I'll answer questions. Uh, by the way, we need more volunteers if you haven't heard that before, both in St. Paul and Seattle and at home. Uh, if uh, you think maybe you have the, would like to do some work at home, we'd sure like to talk to you and see if we can work it out. Some of the skills that we're looking for, it's not, it doesn't have to be all high tech, you know, it's just plain old fashioned do work office skills. If you happen to know how to write grants or you happen to know about planning, that's great. Or if you happen to have good computer skills, that's great. But we use all kinds of sorting skills, putting things in sequence and on and on and on. So I guess what I'd like to do there, uh, Tom, is uh, stop sharing uh, if that's okay with you and we'll answer questions. Bob, yeah, we had some questions in the chat. Hey, this is Dan Belliard. Um, first question we had was talking about, um, I'll just read it here. Thanks for all the hard work you guys are doing to scan and upload records. I have a couple of questions regarding scanning standards being used in the past and currently. Are the BN slash GN station plant plats still being scanned as the GIF files? GIF seems to be challenging to work with. Also, the scanning resolution seems to be low, resulting in illegible, Ill I can't speak. Okay, I'll talk scanning here. Uh, we do some- Legible dimensions in some cases. Sorry, yeah. wow. <laughs> okay, uh, let's talk photographs first. Uh, we use TIFF files for all of our masters. And the reason we do that is a TIFF is once you've made it, it's a, it's a big file but you're not gonna lose uh, data if you copy it and so on. So that's what we do as our masters. We frequently and also make JPEGs 
to be working copies. But uh, our resolution, when you take, uh, uh, say you have a eight by 10 photograph, what we wanna do on the long side of the photograph is have about 6,000 dots. So for an eight by 10, we would scan that at say 600 DPI. If you have a 35 millimeter slide that you're scanning, well, it's about an inch and a quarter long or so. I'm gonna scan that at probably 4,800 DPI. So we can end up with about 6,000 dots on the long side of the, from the original size uh, of the item that came in. Now, if you get the blueprints, uh, the problem with them is many of them are very large and you literally, it's very easy to make files that won't open on the average computer. So what we do there, if you have a, say a 24 by 36 blueprint, we would either scan that at 400 or 600 DPI uh, if you have a blueprint that's, uh, say, 30 inches wide and 10 feet long, you're going to create an enormous file. So we probably would move that down to uh, 200 dpi, but you're still going to get good resolution when you zoom into it, and we're going to save it as a TIFF, and then we may make JPEG uh, working files. Do it the same way on both ends of the, we do it the same way in St. Paul, same way in Seattle. Hey, Bob. Hey. Yeah, go ahead. Bill here. Can I address that um, specifically? Because they were asking about the station plats and structure drawings. Yeah. And I worked on that project with uh, Gary Tarbox. So the originals, that came from a BN um, uh, microfiche, uh, actually, um, in the form of cards. And that was a big project that Great Northern and NP Societies co-funded. <laughs> Uh, we scanned all that material at extremely high resolution in TIFF files. Some of those files are approaching a gigabit in size, and there's no way we could put that online. So what we did is we used the GIF format um, as a compromise that's easily displayable. But the person who asked, and everybody on this call should know, that we have higher resolution versions available, uh, and any member can contact us via archives at gnrhs.org and uh, we'll get you the higher higher resolution version. Yeah. Because he's right. That. Some of these, it's really hard to see dimensions, but the, the files are just too big to put online. The originals, yeah. I mean. Exactly. And uh, we're more than happy to help you with high resolution TIFFs. And if we need to send you a bunch of stuff, uh, we're willing to do that too. Other questions? Yeah, I got another one here for you. Um, what is the resolution of the scanner? Can it do photographs, uh, aerial photographs of routes? So we use different kinds of scanners. Um, most of the stuff we're using right now are Epson 700, 750s, and 850s uh, for slide scanning and, and print scanning up to like eight by 10. And that could include eight by 10 negatives also. And then the, uh, the big contact scanner we have on both ends can also do large photographs. And it can, uh, I think, scan up to, I think the one on the east end is higher resolution than the one on the west end. And the one on the east end is 40 inches wide. And it's a much better one for doing blueprints that have been folded because it has a mode that tends to flatten the fold. On the, on the west end, you actually will see every fold very clearly. I, th I think the highest resolution on that, I'm, I may be wrong, but it could be 2400 on the big scanner. But you don't use it often because uh, you're going to create a huge file that, you know, you'll have to have special, you know, the average computer won't even. Next one. All right, last question in the comments here. Um, Doug says, I would like to see an article on how to access the archives and be able to print files from home computer. I've had problems with this in the past. Okay, so actually, uh, if you go to the joint site right now and you go find a picture of a depot that you'd like, uh, go to the detail and there will be a, a, a link there to a little bit of higher resolution image. And you should be able to, at least on a, uh, a PC, right click on that image and download right to your computer, a relatively, relatively reasonable quality print. Uh, now this may not be documented and that might be actually the part of the question. Is that is that the essential of the question? Is it like instructions? Yeah. 
Okay, so I, I think we certainly could do that. It is not hard to do. I'm not an uh, Apple user, so I assume there's some way you can uh, capture uh, from and, and download direct to, to your computer. Most places allow you to do that, but they don't provide you very high resolution. What we've tried to do at uh, the GN Society is provide you a little more resolution with not making the file too big because we've got a lot of them up there. And uh, if you make a little more resolution, you should be able to print a nice or good looking five by seven that you certainly could use for modeling purposes or figuring out where the handrails are, you know, that kind of thing. But I think, uh, we certainly could put the uh, uh, instructions there. And, and Dan, if you could send me um, the question and also send me the uh, person who asked that I can try to help them. Sure, absolutely. Okay, any others? No, that's all the questions that are in the chat right now. Okay, any from the field here? By the way, if that person's out there who asked that, uh, just uh, email the archives uh, email uh, uh, address on the joint site or the uh, uh, homepage, and we'll be glad to answer that way too. Just a comment there were two episodes or two instances there in the last four minutes where Bob's picture froze on the screen and all the audio stopped just for three or four seconds, then it came back. Uh, I hope that's not a, a permanent glitch. I think it has to do, I'm in a hotel room in St. Paul, Father Dale, and it probably has to do with all of those waking up and they're all logging on. <laughs> I've been getting little notices here too that, that my internet connection was unstable. Uh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Well, there were quite, yeah. a, few party, quite a few parties here last night and it's about noon, so people are, you know, Coming, coming to, clicking on. This is, uh, this is really great. Uh, thank you so much for presenting to us today. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Anything else here you'd like to address, Tom? All right. We're about on time, too. Yeah, we are. That's very nice. Thank you, Mom. That was a wonderful presentation. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing here if I can. Okay, yep. great. Okay, yeah. So the next item on the agenda is lunch. And that will be followed at uh, 1 p.m. Central Time by Bill Sorensen. And then following him at 2 p.m. Central Time is Father Dale. All right, Tom, thanks. Uh Director Bob Schauer is here. Just a reminder, while you guys are having lunch, check out our online auction and bidding all. There's a link to click onto that. You check out the items up for bid on the auction, that money is going to go to the Heritage Fund. Seeing how I can't sell you a ticket. All right, have a good <laughs> lunch. <clears throat> all right, if there are no further questions for Bob. Uh, we'll go on the lunch break and we will see you all at 1 p.m. All right, guys, thank you.